Have you ever asked a question and maybe the answer is just too close for you to actually see it? I was asked about this video by Brother Daryl King and by Pastor Jeremy. And I don't know why they asked this question. It has to do with eternal security. And they know I really don't spend that much time on eternal security. It's not something I like to talk about. Okay, seriously. This particular person, I have seen some of his videos before. Never really commented on them before. But I want to comment on this video. One, because I want to comment on it. And two, they asked me to. And this comes from a guy. His name is Keith Nestor or Netter. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. I'll get it right before the video's over with. I know his first name is Keith, though. And he's speaking about one saved, always saved, calls it a heresy, calls it a calls it dangerous, as a matter of fact. The problem is what he's asking, what he's stating, the answer is so obvious. It's right in front of him and he doesn't see it. Once saved, always saved is a dangerous heresy. Now, the question goes like this. Once a person is saved, is there anything that can change that? Can you go from being saved to unsaved? This is a common statement used to attack Catholicism all of the time. But the fact is, lots of non-Catholic Christians also reject this idea. Well, now that's your first problem. You're Catholic. Uh, and I'm not trying to be ugly, but that's a problem. You're Catholic. Anyone who wants to be, who wants to serve the Lord fully, you, at some point in time, the Spirit is just going to move you away from Catholicism. I'll save that for another point in time. Oh, by the way, your Pope is horrible. But I'll leave that aside for another time. Let's get back to the issue at hand. The Orthodox and even many different types of Protestants object to the idea that once a person is saved, there's nothing that can be done to keep them from staying saved. I've talked about this at length before in a pretty in-depth episode of my podcast, Catholic Feedback, which you can check out if you want to see it. But I've had a few conversations recently with people who come at this issue from a perspective I want to address, and it has to do with an assumption made about our salvation that is treated like some kind of trump card for anyone who disagrees with it. And here's what it is. Salvation is a free gift that you didn't do anything to earn. Therefore, you can't do anything to lose it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a free gift. Now, you all have heard that before. You all have heard that before, that salvation is a free gift because it's a gift. There's nothing that you can do to get it and nothing that you can do to merit it. Well, let's listen to his response. I don't know if you all remember my response to this because I think that what he's asking and his disdain about it being called a gift, I think he's close to the answer, but far away at the same time. Now, that's the big statement right there that's supposed to destroy 2,000 years of Christian teaching about how you can actually lose your salvation. But let's talk about this. Is it really true? The problem with this kind of statement is that, first of all, it's just way too vague because that can mean different things to different people. I mean, how many of us have ever been given a gift that we didn't receive? How many times has someone tried to give you something and you said, no, I don't want to receive that? I see his point. I think the problem is he's making an, an improper analogy. How many of you have been given a gift that you didn't receive? Well, then you didn't get a gift. Someone may have tried to give you a gift, but fine. I get it. I, I see his point, but it's flawed. I'll tell you why in a second, because he's missing it. Just because someone offers you a gift doesn't mean that you have to receive it. There's a cooperation and a, and, and a level of partnership involved when a giver of a gift and a receiver of a gift come together. Is that true? Is there a level of partnership? that's required or involved in the giver and the receiver. Well, not always. I mean, you, a lot of us have been given gifts and we did nothing to do. As a matter of fact, we don't do anything to maintain. Now think about it, oxygen. Right? Someone gave us that, what did you do to get it? What did you do to get or to even merit oxygen? But you use it. Matter of fact, you use it when you don't think about it. And there is no partnership. There was no agreement. You just take advantage of it because it is a free gift. So for someone to say that the idea that it's a free gift means that there's no participation involved with receiving that gift is just dumb. It doesn't work, especially with something like salvation. It's just dumb. It doesn't work. It's arrogant because you you try to find an analogy that uh, maybe you don't like or what have you that makes sense to you. But I'm going to give you not an analogy, but an actual truth. And I would love for you, by the way. No one has ever refuted this, and you will not be able to refute this because it's in the scriptures, and there's no other way that you can get around this. 
None whatsoever. No anecdote that you come up with, no other analogies, what have you. Furthermore, when you talk about a free gift that you've received, does that mean that you keep it forever? Why wouldn't you? What, what, some gifts are perishable, some gifts are not. And forever, what do you mean forever? Well, nothing is forever except for God and, and also salvation, as well as hell if you go there. But you're putting stipulations onto this because you don't want to fit your beliefs. Not at all. How many times have you received a gift and then you had it for a while and then you lost it or you got rid of it or you donated it or whatever? Just because you received something as a free gift doesn't mean that you always keep it. So when people try to apply this analogy as some sort of blanket statement over the top of salvation, as though this means once saved, always saved, it just falls apart. He is just missing it. It's almost like you want to stop him, grab him, say, hey, turn him so you can see actually what it is that he's missing. We'll do so later. But the problem is people don't care. They just get stuck in this agenda that they have and everything you say, every other scripture verse that comes against it, everything the church fathers say about it, they just do full stop because in their mind, this, this idea of a free gift is all they care about. Now, why do people do that? Okay, two things. First of all, stop bringing up the church fathers. There are those that want to go to the church fathers. And let me just deal with this. We'll come back to the church fathers in a little bit, but he loves to bring up the church fathers, especially as a Catholic. Here's the reason why. First of all, we don't care what the church fathers think. Now, is there some benefit to hearing what the church fathers believed? The early church fathers? Sure. But was there complete consensus amongst the church fathers? No, it was not. Not even amongst this. We've covered this before, so I won't spend too much time in it. But here's how we know we don't really care what the early church fathers believe, except what scripture says. Jesus made statements to the disciples, to the apostles. And immediately after he makes a statement, what do they do? They go somewhere else, start thinking about something else. Even with those that have the Holy Spirit, where they may not have even fully understood. There's a reason why Paul confronts Peter, who both had the Holy Spirit, both were apostles, but they one was in error. Same thing with Barnabas. As a matter of fact, causing others. But the more important thing is the problem with trying to figure out what the early church fathers have or what they believe is we don't have all of the writings of, of the early church fathers. We don't have the writings of the early Christians, all of the early Christians. We don't know what all the Christians thought, those who didn't write. You know why? Because for a large chunk of our Christian history, who dominated Christian thought? Who maintained tight control over what was spoken, what was said? Who was the one who didn't want you or I or anyone else to actually read the Bible and know it for ourselves? They were the church. They were the fathers. They were the voice that we had to listen to. Oh, I know, the Catholic Church. And so it's a bit rich when they say it. Well, quite simply, they do that because they have an agenda. They want to believe that salvation is a free gift, and therefore, that means they don't have to do anything, and that means that they never can lose it, because what does that lead to? It means that you don't ever have to worry anymore about anything with regard to your own personal holiness or your own sinfulness. No matter what you do, no matter whatever happens, you can always rest assured that you know your salvation is safe. Again, what's rich is, and this isn't really all that difficult, when you compare the average Protestant versus the average Catholic, their view of the Bible, different. And I'm talking about those that attend church, that attend their masses. And so let's just be clear. Why? Because they've got someone that they have this go between, which, by the way, is unbiblical. But I, I don't want to make this a Catholic versus Protestant church uh, issue, but I don't want I don't want the Catholic Church or anyone in the Catholic Church to start lecturing anyone about holiness. Now, by the way, there are some Catholic people who are Catholics who do love the Lord, just like there are Protestants. And I don't think that anyone is trying to live in sin and live as a Christian because that means that the person that's trying to live in sin is not a Christian. And no and 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 we're not saying that you can live how you want to live and still be saved. Stop straw manning what the belief is, what the understanding is. And again, that's a nice fantasy, but it's just not what the scripture teaches. And it's not what the church fathers taught. Now, for some people, they don't care. They have their idea. They have their couple of verses that they've cherry picked out and come up with this with this idea. And they're never going to depart from that. Now, one of the things that also um, I don't like, and we'll get into his scriptures in just a second. But when they say that you cherry pick certain passages, well, one thing for sure over here, we don't cherry pick passages. As a matter of fact, we listen to what others 
who disagree with what their passages are, and we cover them. We've actually even made videos over all of their passage. If you cannot find one, they're probably inside other videos, but fine. If you think we haven't covered an actual passage that you think says you can lose your salvation, send it to me. I'll make a vi I'll make a video over it, or I will point you to the video that covers that passage. We've covered every last one of those. And again, those folks, they're missing something. They're missing two big things, two huge things. We'll cover that in a second, but let's go ahead and listen to some of the passages that he goes to that shows us why those who believe in eternal security, why we're wrong. But for those who want to argue, let's look at a couple of verses that, in my opinion, make this position completely untenable. And the first one is from John chapter 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Did you notice the, that both things, you could say faith and works, are a part of this this equation that we must have in order to be saved, right? He says that you've got to believe and you can't disobey. And he doesn't say that, well, if you disobey God, you just won't receive as many rewards in heaven, or you just won't have a certain kind of fellowship with God. So let's go to that scripture and let's see if his understanding is correct. As a matter of fact, let's get the understanding of it. This is, this is Jesus speaking in John 3. Now, what has he already spoken to us in John 3? Well, he already told us, speaking at the very beginning, that a person must be born from above. That's not you. That's him. Those that must be born from above. And keeping in mind, because Jesus gets on Nicodemus for not knowing this, he says, you're a teacher of Israel. You don't know this. What is the this? That a person who was born from above, that's being born of the spirit, that's not you, that that person also, according to where this first comes of being born of water and spirit, that comes from Ezekiel 36, 25, 26, 27. And that those who are born of the spirit, he'll put his spirit in them and then cause them to walk in his ordinances. So when we get to verse 36, by the way, we already covered the fact that those who are believing, the high pistol ones, which, which we'll see this again, the believing ones will never perish. This is a statement, a point that Jesus makes. That person will never perish. And so when we get to 36, what do we see? The high pistol one. So he's telling us, declaring what the high pistol one is, the, the one that's believing in the son. What does he have, Keith? This word, aki means has. He has life right now. Eke zoe aoni. He has life into the ages. So he has life into the ages. So he's living now into the ages or living forever or living or life eternal when does he have that keith according to the passage right now but then there's a contrast that's why we have the word but it's post positive but the one that's apathetic apathon this is a person with the word apathetic this word and by the way some versions might say either disbelieve or does not believe or obey it's fine the same word means to refrain or to not believe uh, and, and it works the same way. If you don't believe something, you won't do something. And that's his point. He didn't say the person is uh, not believing and not obeying, but he contrasts the believer with the one who's not. That's the point. Uh, and that person will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him, remains on him. So it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the text, which causes him to believe that if a person is a believer, but then also is disobedient. That's not what the pastor says. This pastor does not say that a person is a believer, but also disobedient. He contrasts the believer, the one that's believing, with the person that's disobedient. So what can't the disobedient person be? If you want to use that word, which also the word also means to disbelieve or not be believing. You cannot make it to say that it is a person who believes and is disobedient. That's where your understanding one of the, of the language comes in, but also it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of just English. We don't see that. Don't make it say what it doesn't say. That's not really about salvation. That's about fellowship. That's about rewards, but that's not what Jesus said at all. And for someone to make that claim is just flat out dishonesty or completely delusional. And for you to make that statement, not maybe because you're just delusional, Maybe it's just, and I don't mean to just use this word because folks get bothered by this word, but it's truth, just ignorant. Ignorant of the text, ignorant of the of the, of the Greek, because it's clear what, what's being stated here. You're adding to the text. The second text I want to point to comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. And Paul writes these words. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, clearly he's talking to people who actually believed. He's talking to people who received the gift. So you can't make the case, well, 
He's not talking about people who actually were Christians, but just thought they were pretended to be. No, he's saying that you received and that you believed unless you believed in vain. Now, how can you believe in vain it, when, with, with regard to your salvation if belief's all you need? Okay, so let's respond to him because, again, he doesn't know the text or he's taking what he believes and putting it onto the text. So let's go back to it. He says, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved. Uh, if you hold fast the word which I preach, that is, let's say it again, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. A couple of things. One, uh, he's he, the question is there, or that needs to be asked and answered. Are these necessarily believers? Well, if you are a believer, this is true. If you're not a believer, you're covered as well. He says, I make known to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved. So he says that you are saved, but here's a question, Keith, or anyone else. Is there ever a possibility, the likelihood, the chance of Paul ever, or anyone else, writing a letter to the church, and there would be unbelievers there that would also hear it? When you go to your Catholic mass, or when a person goes to church, are there people there that will hear the message, hear the gospel, and aren't saved? Well, sure. Well, what 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 do you tell them? As a matter of fact, where are those passages that speak to those to warn the people who aren't saved, those who may even think that they're saved that aren't? But I want you to notice there's a reason why Paul makes this statement. He says, if, and the word if is there, if you hold, now the word hold fast, you can call it hold fast or just hold, if you hold the what? The word. I'll come back to that in a second, which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. There's two things I want to point out. One, if you ever notice when the Bible speaks about someone falling away or what have you, or seeming to depart or to going astray, apostasy, have you ever read the passages and noticed what they're falling away from, what they're leaving, what they're departing from? One, it's the noun, not the verb. I'll come back to this passage in just a second, but let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse one, this passage comes up a lot, but ex but the spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Notice Keith or anyone else. This is the noun, tes pesteos, which is the faith, not from having faith, uh, from the, not from, from the belief, but not from believing. We'll see that over and over. Paul makes a statement. He says that I have kept the faith. I thought I've kept believing. Why wouldn't Paul just use the verb? Because that's what we're talking about. Why is that? Why is tes Pestios different than ha pistuan. One is a verb, one is a noun. When we're described as those who are saved, the verb is used, the believing ones, those that are believing, versus the faith, because you can have a set of beliefs and then leave those sets of beliefs, such as somebody he's going to quote later who once believed this. Now I believe that. This is what they're talking about. You you leave a set of beliefs, uh, a tenant of the faith. He says, they will depart from the faith. That's important because you can do just that. That's what that's what Paul is speaking of in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, by the way, this issue of believing in vain. Can a person believe in vain? Well, if you hold to a set of beliefs, if you believe these are the, the, the set of beliefs, and then you don't. One, you have left that, which is possible, you believed in vain. But notice what this word is here. And I want to point it out too. It says that, uh, which I preach to you, um, you received in which you stand, if which also you are saved, if you hold fast. That's right here, unless you believed in vain. This word right here, Aki, I want to pull up on the screen so you can see what this word means. This means uh, there being of no cause or reason, uh, being without success or result, no avail, or being without purpose to no purpose, being without careful thought due consideration. They all kind of flow together. And so the point is, you can think about something, you can believe something and be in vain. You can think that, you know what, if I commit a crime, then I'll, I, there's a chance that I'll go to jail and I don't want to do that, but then go and commit a crime. Well, what you thought, you thought of in vain. And this is where he, he makes the, uh, the, the point. This is where we can see he is saying, if you hold fast, if, by the way, the word 
a may if not or unless or the same word if not if not or unless you believe in vain so he's making a distinction keith this is clear he's clearly making a distinction between those that did believe versus the true believers and those that believe in vain is it possible for there to be true believers right beside uh faux believers those who are believing in vain can the two sit together and if the two sit together and you're preaching and they're both there. How do you distinguish between the two? How would they know who's distinguishing between the two? How can you cover both camps? Well, the way you would cover both the true believers and the believers who are believing in vain, the ones who don't hold fast the word. And there's a reason why I'm using that as well. The reason the way you would do so is if you use this word a or a may, which is unless to say unless that's you. So true believers, you are saved. Those that place their faith in Christ, you are saved. That is, if you actually did place your faith in Christ. Did you see what I did? I used the word if to distinguish between those that are truly believers and those that have fooled themselves, the, the false converse. Why is this important? Because if we go to something that Jesus says, he says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I, I like you, uh, using Luke 8, but also look to uh, Matthew 13 and 8, I mean 13 as well. In Luke 8, notice he says about the parable of the seed and the sowers, and he's speaking about the word falling or the seed falling on certain soils and how it works out, how there's only really one group. There's only one example where there, there's actual, the, the true word is sown into, into the good ground. All the others, as and he's equated to believers, only one group of people are saved. Notice what he says in verse 11. I speak, as Jesus explained this parable, he says, those beside the road are those who have heard, so it's possible to hear those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe. Notice what the word here is. This word is pistusantes. This is those who are, it's, 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 it's just like the pistuans. How do I know? Because this is an aorist active participle. So though he, the, the, the enemy doesn't want them to be the believing ones. Now, we won't get into how the devil can possibly do that. We've covered that before, but the goal is to make sure that no one is the believing ones. Well, the issue is not the word. The issue is the ground. Notice what it was sold, sown on. It was sown beside the road, not on the good soil. Verse 13, those on the rocky soil, notice the ground that's being sold on. And they're going to ask a question. You should know the answer. What is the soil? Uh, receive those on rocky soil are those who, when they hear, they hear and receive the word with joy, which happens. These are people that get excited about it, but they end up becoming what we call false converts. These have no firm root. Look what he says. They believe for a while. And the word that's used here is not the participle. This word right here is pistousin. It's not the participle. Uh, they believe for a while. And in time of temptation, they fall away. They leave. The seed which fell among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked. Well, where, what ground did it fall on? Well, they fell on the soil that had thorns. Go to verse 15. But the seed on the good soil, that's the important point, the good soil. So when the word is heard in, a, in the good soil, sown in good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart. Going back to John 3, which you started off, you went to verse 36, but what about the beginning of John 3? The heart is the issue, which we talked about many times before. The heart is the issue. So what does he say? The one, These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So what will they do if, they, if the word is received in uh, a good soil? What's the good soil? The heart. Question, Keith, or anyone else. Who determines if the heart is a good heart? Catholic question for all my Catholic friends, believers and non-believers, false converts and true converts. Who determines if the heart is a good heart? Who determines if the soil is a good soil? Is it you? You won't find the pastor that says so. Now, the Bible does tell us to circumcise your heart, but then he, we find out that we can't. And so what has God stated from the very beginning? That he will do so. When will God circumcise a heart? How will he do so? Well, we see that in John 3. We see that in John 1. We see that in Romans, we see that in Ephesians, we see that in Titus, and so we see that in 1 Peter. 1 Peter says that God caused us to be born again or be born from above. So this is an act of God. So going back to your passage, those that believed in vain, 
This is what he we're, we're talking about. Those that we see in the parable of the seeds and the soil, those who believe in vain. Now, where's another passage we can go to? Matthew 13. Notice what it says. Another example of that, of the same seed, of the, the same seed and soils. He says, uh, verse 23, and the one whom the seed was sown on the good soil, that, that is a person. This is the man who hears the word and understands it. So the person who understands it, it is who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some hundredfold. Now, this word understanding it, that means they intellectually get it. Everyone can intellectually get it, but they take it. They receive it to heart. Going back again to what we're speaking of, the good heart. Right? That should be the end right there. But he says, look, you can have this. You receive in which you will be saved and are being saved. Notice there he talks about it as being a process. But the big fat word there is if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. Now, I don't know if you caught what he did. He actually threw something in. I don't know if he did it intentionally or ignorantly, but it doesn't go on. It's still wrong. He says that if you are being saved and it's a process, well, that word's not there. By the way, the salvation is happening to you. That's someone else doing it to you. We've covered the fact that the middle voice and the passive voice used in salvation indicates that it's not you doing it. It's God's doing it on his behalf. And that's going to get to our point in just a second. I said earlier, I want you to stick around and find out how he's missing it, how everyone else, if anyone believes that you can lose your salvation, I want to show you how you're missing it. What do they say? You're missing the trees for the forest. It's literally right there in front of you. As a matter of fact, even how you phrase the question, or in this case, Keith or anyone else, how you defend those that pose this question about this gift being a free gift. Second Peter chapter two, verses 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire. Again, this destroys this position that you can never lose your salvation because these people in, that Peter's talking to here, they clearly have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord. See, what people want to say is, well, they never really were safe. No, it clearly says that they were, but it also says that if they depart from it, then they're worse off now than they would if they'd never heard the truth. How can they be worse off if they've received something that can never be taken away from them? I wonder if he hears himself. I wonder if he's so fascinated or enamored with what he thinks he knows and he's just missing. Let's go to the passage. He's not speaking to Christians. How do we know? Well, he tells us. He says, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by knowledge. Now, a couple of things. Who's Peter speaking to? Well, he's speaking to, he tells us, to those that are dispersed to who? To these Jews. Now, is it possible that Gentile believers are going to hear this too? Absolutely. But he's making a point and he says they have escaped the defilement of the world by their what? By their knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, every time we see that someone has moved away, they moved away from the word, from the knowledge, from the understanding. They don't, they no longer hold to that. Notice what he says though. They are again entangled in them and are overcome. Now, this issue about overcome, the Bible tells us that those that are believing ones that have been caused to be born again, he says that we will overcome the world. Not that the world will overcome us, but anyway, he says that the last state has become worse for them than the first. But here what it says, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness again, not to have known what the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed down to them. Which holy commandment handed down to who? Well, he's speaking obviously of these Jews. It has happened to them according to the proverb. Now, even if you don't want to take it as though that they are Jews, that's fine. Look at the last part. He says a dog returns to its own vomit. So what are we, speak, are we speaking of? We're not speaking of Christians. We're speaking of dogs, pigs, unclean folks, folks who have not gotten the word, who are not saved. This is the answer there that you're looking for. And the problem is you're such a, in such a hurry to make your point. You're missing the answer that you think you're asking. Now, I want to play this clip because he, he wants to refer to it. They do this all the time. They refer to the early church fathers because a lot of the early church fathers were influenced by Catholic thought. As a matter of fact, some of the writings were destroyed by those who oppose Catholic thought. I don't mean the universal church. I mean the actual organization. 
but he's going to quote Tertullian. But it should matter what the earliest Christians believed because they were closest to the teaching of the apostles. It's, it's highly unlikely that something so foundational as your salvation that these guys are going to get so completely wrong when it comes to this issue. Justin Martyr, writing around 160 AD, says this, I hold further that those of you who have confessed and known this man to be Christ, yet who have gone back for some reason into the legal dispensation, i.e. the Mosaic law, and have denied that this man is Christ and have not repented before death, you will by no means be saved. So those of you who know Jesus, but you've gone back to the old law or you've gone back to some kind of false religion that you were in before, if you don't repent before you die, you're not saved. And by the way, I agree with that. I think that's in keeping what we're saying. Anyone that is not maintaining their salvation, so to speak, which you'll like that, or continuing, continuing to believe or continue to have faith or continue to follow them, that's not a Christian. But we believe that Christians have the Holy Spirit in them, and they will do so. I'll come back to that in just a little bit. From Tertullian, from 213 AD, he says this, God had foreseen that faith, even after baptism, would be endangered. He saw that most persons, after obtaining salvation, would be lost again by soiling the wedding dress, by failing to provide oil for their torches. Problem is, though, this is why you don't actually want to quote them and live by them. One, the word is clearer than they are. Two, they are so vastly inconsistent. He's a Catholic. There's a reason why Tertullian is not even called a saint. Why? Because he embraced a heresy uh, known as Montanism, uh, where, they, where he's getting these new prophecies. He's a new prophet and so forth. But also he's a hypocrite because he believes, he interprets 1 Corinthians, um, chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7 to be that they should re remain celibate though he himself was married and not celibate. So we don't listen to Tertullian. Are there some things that we can kind of get some, glean some thought as to what the church, first church believed? Yeah, but in the end, ultimately it's going to be the scriptures, not Tertullian or Oregon or Clement or, or whomever. There are some things we can look to, but again, these were fallen people themselves who needed grace, who needed faith. And then you have the issue about this issue about uh, it being a free gift. And this is where we're going to go ahead and eliminate his argument. This word, but the free gift, some versions would say the free gift or the gift. The word that's used here is the word charisma. And the reason why some versions might say the free gift, because it's 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 freely given graciously. I don't have a problem if you just use the word gift or free gift, but he has an issue with it being a gift and or not a, that being a gift, but that there's something that you have to do to maintain the gift. Think about that for a second. And this is where he is going to have a problem with answering or rebutting this. You would think, oh, no, Corey, I think he's got he's got a point. And I, guess what? I'm going to go along with this point to some degree that the person who receives the gift has a responsibility to keep the gift. Let's think about that for a second. Well, first of all, not always. Again, we use the example of air, oxygen. We use the example of, of gravity. Those are those are gifts, clearly. And we do nothing to, to, to keep those. Someone else does so. And then it also deals with these covenants. That if God has given an unconditional covenant saying that he's going to do this, irrespective of anyone else, there's no condition put to it. Well, then there's no, no maintaining of this gift on our part. But if you want to hold to what he's saying, that the gift, uh, the person that receives the gift, they are responsible for keeping the gift. Okay, fine. That's why you ought to believe in eternal security. That's why Keith or anyone else, you ought to believe in one saved, always saved. How do I know? Well, let's go back to the Bible and let's go to John chapter six and let's put on the screen. And then you tell me if we have to worry about the person receiving the gift, if we have to worry about him keeping the gift, maintaining the gift, not losing the gift. Jesus says, all that the father gives to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will not certainly cast out. Who's he speaking of? Well, we know he's speaking of believers, of Christians. How did Jesus get the believers? How did he get his sheep? How did he get these get us as Christians? Well, he just said it. He says, all the Father gives to me. As a matter of fact, verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, that's the word, uh, where we get dorea or dedokin, this is, or in this case, dedosin, and dead doken. Notice when they were given, by the way, in this point, this is the perfect tense in order that all of the ones that were given, he came that in order that the Sahina clause keep, which states the purpose of him coming in, which goes back to John three, by the way, in order that all of the ones 
who were perfect tense given. They had been given him in the past. It's a completed action in the past. Even though when he makes a statement, a lot of folks, most Christians haven't been given yet, haven't come to him yet, but they have been given to him. So what's the gift that has to be maintained? Well, here we have the father who gave a gift to the son. So Keith, does Jesus have a responsibility to keep the gift, to maintain the gift, to make sure that he doesn't lose any of the gift? Fine. If you say so, what does Jesus say about the gift? All that he has given to me will come to me. They all will come to me and I will not cast any of them out. He says, 39, it's the will that all that he has given, all of the gifts, the entirety of the gift, I will not, not lose any, not lose, not one, but raise them in the last day. So what gift are you, are you focusing on? It's what it really is like. It's like if I gave this person a puppy, well, the person that was received, that received the puppy, that person, fine. He's responsible for taking care of the puppy. The puppy has responsibilities as he grows up and so forth, what have you, but he's going to be a puppy. He's going to be who he is or whatever, but ultimately it's going to be the owner. In this case, God, the father gave the son, Jesus, a gift. So answer your question now, Keith, will the gift receiver ever lose any of the gift? Notice what's not here, Keith. In here, there is no condition. He does not say that if, as long as the gift is obedient, he does not say that as long as the gift keeps believing, he does not say that as long as the gift is following. As a matter of fact, he says all that he's given will come. And notice that they will come. And the word that's used here uh, will come. This word is a future tense. So it, this is going to happen. Every single one and every single one that will come are the ones that were given. Every single one that will come that were given are the gift from who? From God to the to, uh, to, to Jesus. And then what does he say about that very gift? All that's in that gift. How many of that gift will he lose, Keith or anyone else? Not one, according to him. So what you can do is stop the foolishness, stop the misunderstanding, stop the ignorant explanations, stop missing the trees for the forest, because he says it literally. This and, and using your same rationale, your same explanation, this is clear. He will not lose one, which is why it is vitally important to understand what he stated in the very beginning. Once the spirit is in our heart, what does he say in Jeremiah 32, 39 and 40? He says, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good. That's what he says in verse 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them. So he won't turn away from us. And he says, and I will put the fear of me in their what hearts? There's that heart. And that and in that way, so that they will not turn away from me. So the people that have the spirit of God in their heart, one, God will never turn away from them. And, and those people also will never turn away from God. It says the same thing in, in Ezekiel 36. And in case Keith or anyone else wants to come back and say, well, that's speaking of Israel. John 1 clarifies even what he says in John 3, how it applies. Because in John 3, those are the people that are born from above. Their heart is born from the Spirit of God. And then in John 1, 12, he says, this is everyone. Whoever it has to be that is born, you are born not of flesh or the will of man, but you were born, why? Or from what? From the will of God. And the Bible says, First Peter, Peter tells us, 1 Peter 1, 3, that he calls all of us. He calls us to be born again. We didn't do so. God does so. And so, my friend, if you want to hold to that, fine. You are in error. You are false. You are wrong. One, not just because you belong to this, to, to the Catholic Church, which is heretical in and of itself, but you have no scriptural backing. If you got a scripture you think that, that, that nails your point, send it. So far, we've dealt with every last one of them, but we've given passages that no one on your side will ever refute. What do they do? They go to other passages. So, Keith, my friend... I don't doubt the sincerity of your heart. I just doubt the, the sincerity of your understanding. That's the point. You clearly have missed the text.